the function first approach to the origin of language, a methodological suggestion for how to think about the evolutionary foundation of symbolic communication. So before I start with the content of this presentation, I'm just going to briefly explain how the entire thing is going to work. So this presentation is structured as one big argument. So do not expect uh, tiny arguments that come to a conclusion at the end. No, um, you have to listen to the whole thing to understand the conclusion at the end. So at the beginning, I'm going to explain the problem. And that is mainly the dilemma of cooperation in language. Then I'm going to explain our suggestion, so how the function first approach can help us solve, uh, actually dissolve this problem. And uh, the function first approach explains how novel traits emerge. Then I'm going to explain um, how this um, application would work. Then also how it dissolves both problems um, I'm going to talk about. And then at the end, I'm going to explain how uh, this application actually helps us uh, reformulate um, the problem of language evolution. So let us start off, uh, start off with the introduction. So our main thesis is language evolution can be explained by using the established toolbox of evolutionary biology, which will then help us to formulate the problem of language evolution in an entirely new manner. So to understand this, one has to think about what language is, because the hypothesis of how language emerged or evolved uh, depends on what a person's theory of language actually is. And there are two main schools um, in this debate that I'm going to briefly explain right now. And the first one is, of course, the Chomsky school. Um, they believe that language emerged um, as one discrete biological step. It began as an internal language caused by a single mutation. It is innate and therefore uh, the search for how it emerged is actually not that useful or would be not that useful. Um, and they see language as a generative machine that either works or doesn't. And this is where we get to the first problem, the problem of graduality of syntactical structure. So the idea here is that, well, since language is a generative machine that either works or doesn't, um, how could language then evolve gradually? The idea is, well, it can't. It either works or it does not. Then we come to the constructivists. They follow a more usage-based approach and they see language as um, always changing and also as a complex system of pairing symbols and meanings. Um, convention plays a huge role here because of course, if um, multiple individuals uh, apply uh, different names to different things uh, without any convention, then they wouldn't be able to uh, communicate at all. And this leads us to the problem of trust. The problem of trust says basically that, well, in a natural environment, it seems that deception would be likely since words are cheap. But at the same time, um, we see that trust is actually the default in human communication. But why is that? The idea is that before language could emerge, there already had to be um, a basic level of trust um, in uh, the environment before language could first emerge. But actually solving, per se, both of these problems is not at all the aim of this presentation, because Instead of beginning with the metaphysics and then developing a narrative from there, um, we are going to take a um, evolutionary theory on how traits emerge and evolve, more specifically the function first approach, and apply it to the problem of language evolution and see where it leads us. So briefly, what is the function first approach? Um, well, 
it states that new functions are initially fulfilled by an already existing structure that then assumes the new function. And of course, if this uh, then benefic benefits reproductive fitness, that is, if it is adaptive, it will then be selected by natural selection. And I hope to explain to you why, um, if we do apply the function first approach to the problem of language evolution, um, that we can actually we reformulate the problem and then end both of the problems I just mentioned. So the problem of graduality of syntactical structures and the problem of trust. So coming to the second part of this presentation, the problem of human cooperativeness and trust. Uh, more, specific, more specifically, the problem of trust can be reduced to the problem of cooperativeness. So, this is the argument. Cooperation needs gossip. Um, we think that gossip is the only way that you can actually stabilize such a behavior. But gossip already needs language, which seems to entail that language needs some cooperation. But this is, of course, a problem since cooperation needs gossip and language needs cooperation. But if you do not buy this argument, there are a few other possible explanations um, that I'm going to present right now and also try to explain uh, which uh, what problems they have or what problems have been identified with these um, other theories. So the first one would be um, reciprocity. There are two types of reciprocity. The first one is called direct reciprocity, which is basically you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And um, it has been identified, um, it has been seen that there are very different levels of reciprocity between um, humans and other apes. And the idea here is that reciprocity was actually the start of human cooperation. And, well, the criticism of this theory is that it is only stable when free riding is minimized. And it can be minimized by, for example, something like punishment, um, like exclusion. But the issue here is that uh, punishment can only secure a specific level of cooperation. So it can stabilize a trait, but it does not have, um, um, it cannot provide enough positive, uh, it cannot actually provide any uh, positive selective pressure. And therefore something like intersubjectivity could not have developed as an obligation to cooperate here. So this is why uh, reciprocity is then uh, inviolable to understand uh, the, the uh, human cooperativeness. So then there's indirect reciprocity, which is when a behavior between two individuals is secured by a third party that hears about it. So through gossip or image scoring. So the idea is two individuals interact and then one of them goes to another individual and says, oh, that individual was or was not cooperative. But of course, um, uh, you, see, you, you, you see by these, exam these example that you actually already need, need a system that communicates past actions and that individuals are able to develop internal image of other, of other agents for um, indirect reciprocity to be um, possible. So, of course, if we're talking about how the, this cooper, co cooperation emerged, this is actually not a uh, well and uh, good, good enough explanation. Um, now we come to the tender defender hypothesis, which is basically um, females so, uh, would select males with more pro-social attitudes. So, we know that Females go for males that are more respected. But now we have to think about where this respect lies upon, uh, relies upon. So if it relies upon dominance, then females would go after the more dominant male. 
And of course, if this respect relies upon pro-sociality, then they would go after the more pro-social individuals. And the criticism here is that, well, if they go after the more pro-social individuals, then pro-sociality is already a value. So it, does, it doesn't really explain how cooperativeness can emerge in the first place. It seems that pro-sociality is already there. And then we come to reputation economy, which is basically uh, individuals gossiping and interacting about uh, interacting with each other in uh, talking about other individuals. But then we come to the same dilemma that I explained uh, with our suggestion, but this seems to be the only account left. And I'll explain how uh, later how this is actually not uh, uh, the huge problem it's, it appears to be. Uh, so, of course, um, the criticism here is what I just explained. The reputation economy needs a circulation of individuals' past actions. So, briefly, this is, uh, this is how this process works then. So, linguistic communication will only emerge when communicators can be trusted. Communicators can only be trusted if being cooperative is adaptive. Cooperativeness is adaptive if reputation built on past actions has fitness consequences. And a reputation economy can only fully emerge when people learn about the past behavior of others through gossip. And gossip requires language, spoken, signed, or using any other um, suitable media. So now we come to behavioral plasticity as the source of innovation. Um, specifically formulating the evolutionary function. So, uh, to understand um, the biological function, um, we can define it like this. S has a biological function F if and only if 1. F is a direct consequence of S's being there. Um, for example, the ability to fly is a direct consequence of the structure of wings. And two, S is the way it is because it fulfilled F. So, as an example, the structure of the wing was shaped through adaptation by natural selection for its function of flying. Well, but why is this differentiation even important? Because... Uh, in, assertion, in assertion number one, we are talking about approximate causation, and in assertion number two, we're talking about what we call the ultimate causation, or also what it's called in biology, the proper evolutionary function. And this differentiation is very important to over overcome the intuition that causes uh, include intentions, so trying to find teleological explanations, and it is also important to note that in assertion number two, the because um, in S is the way it is because it fulfilled F refers to the process of random variation and non-random selection. So it is important for us to think about it um, not uh, of this because not as something that has a specific goal in mind but as this process of random variation and non-random selection. Um, and this differentiation is especially important for us uh, human beings because it is difficult for us to understand design without intention. And now I have to talk about the three main blunders uh, people have when trying to understand and explain evolution. So the first one is confusing the proximate and ultimate causation. And this, is, this usually happens when we take our personal experiences as fundamental. So we think, no, I chose to help my friend. I helped him because I wanted to. When actually the important question in biology is to think about um, an eventual um, context in which uh, helping a few individuals became evolutionary adaptive and uh, beneficial for, for the individual. 
Well, the second problem, of course, comes with uh, naive group selection issues. So um, that states that the survival of a species is the... Because, of course, the survival of the species is the direct cause of the behavior. So the problem here is that displacement events are always in the future and there is therefore no real causation. Instead, what actually happens is that an organism is an executor of past adaptations. This is also very important to keep in mind. And the third blunder is the more nuanced one because and it deals with uh, the the distinction um, of the proper evolutionary function from descriptions of how the function is used for a specific purpose. So we know that the evolutionary function of a wing is to fly, but flying can also be used for other purposes. So when we look at a wing structure, we can correctly infer that it developed for flying. But what we cannot do is look at a wing structure and infer the purposes of flying. That is a mistake because it's much more speculative and this process um, actually isn't as simple as this um, um, uh, the sentence uh, um, try, to sh- try to explain it to me. So what can we take from here? that it is impossible to infer the purpose of the structure from the, the, this operation I just explained and vice versa. And what is then the consequence for our methodology? That the evolutionary function should be formulated first in a direct and mechanical way without speculating about the potential purpose in a specific situation. Now we come to the function first approach to the evolution of a trait. Um, The relation between the biological structure of a trait and its evolutionary function is number one, the biological structure explains why a certain function can be fulfilled. This is the proximate causation, what I just mentioned. And two, the structure evolved as an adaptation for the function. And this is the ultimate causation. And again, if, um, let me just briefly summarize it in this tiny, uh, tiny image here. Basically, the biological structure evolved as an adaptation for the biological function. And now, and then the biological function is fulfilled by the biological structure. But now we come to a problem. And the idea, he, the idea here is pretty simple. But then, how could something like a leg evolve when a leg is an adaptation for walking and walking seems to be impossible without legs? And the answer to that is um, actually pretty simple. The function-first approach to the evolution of a novel trait. And this states that the, the assumption is here that, in, as, exp- as I already explained, an already existing structure can be used in a different way and assume a new or an additional function that eventually modifies the original structure as it adapts to the new function. And what is the implication of that? Well, it tells us that the proximate cause is what makes a new behavior possible and also that the proximate cause is older than the ultimate cause which explains the structure of a trait so the initial trigger for the development of a new trait is then an environmental or social change that makes a behavior adaptive and altogether this suggests that language evolved in this way an evolutionary configuration, uh, so first, an evolutionary configuration occurs in which a novel function becomes adaptive. Two, 
something already in place that is uh, that is used to fulfill uh, there is already something in place that is used to fulfill the novel function three the elements that are used to fulfill the new function adapt to their new use and now we come to language and its proper function specifically the structure of imagination so First of all, let's mention Dor's idea of a uh, language evolving to overcome epistemic loneliness. Dor based this theory on a phenomenology and existentialism, and his idea was basically what would we miss without this specific entity, this entity being language. Um, Dor argues that we would miss the ability to share experiences and that would lead, uh, would lead us to be epistemic lonely. And language for him is this technology that uh, allows us to share these exper uh, experiences. And uh, we'll say that this uh, theory is actually interesting due to the relevance that epistemic loneliness has. One only needs to look at um, authors like Kierkegaard or um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe to see how it's actually a very present and relevant theme um, in literature, for example. But when we're talking about language evolution, it, it is rather unrealistic since um, epistemic loneliness seems to be a modern and privileged Western idea that has... Um, um, that cannot be observed anywhere else. So, uh, we have to state here that intuition, phenomenology, and introspections are actually non-starters for a naturalistic project, but we hope to show that the application of the function-first approach will actually also extinguish these problems posed by Dor. Now we come to the proper evolutionary function of language. So, of course, as I explained, now we need to discover the proper evolutionary function of language. And we can do that um, twofold. We can either uh, start with the trait and then infer the function, or we can presume the function and go on from there. And it is. It has been often suggested that the um, uh, proper evolutionary function, the function of language, is actually to transmit propositions and uh, for displacement, which is basically to confer non-present actions, and it should also um, allow for open-ended productivity. So, we'll take this general definition of language to um, move on from here. So, uh, propositional, the, the definition would then be propositional communication, which also entails the power of displacement and includes open-ended productivity. And we would argue that this concept is good because it, will, it can also integrate um, non-verbal expressions like mimetic and conventional gestures, but also because it allows for storytelling, which is basically just displacement. And now we move on to the function first approach to language evolution, specifically applying the function first approach to language evolution. Again, the first the function first approach suggests that language developed from a display of natural signs that refer to displaced actions. And this is interesting because it allows for one competence without comprehension and two the usage of natural signs um, also overcomes the problem of trust. But we'll come to that to that. Um, it had been observed that female chimpanzees join groups and mate more frequently with males that give them meat. And that could be explained um, by sexual selection. But we would argue that it could also be explained by uh, females choosing mates according to their past actions. And 
how could that look like? So male chimpanzees, uh, it has been observed that a few of them actually do this. Male chimpanzees carry around dead infants from other groups without eating them. And if this behavior is adaptive, it could be beneficial by, for example, influencing the behavior of other towards the displayer. And this would be basically the, the dynamic. So we have one original structure, which has been identified as playing an exploitive behavior, um, which is the displaying of the dead infant. Then there is an adaptive part of the original structure, um, the drawing of attention of others to the object itself. And this structure over time will adapt to the new function, which is now to draw attention. And if this, adapt this is adaptive, it will be selected and a more exaggerated, exaggerated presentation um, can be expected over time. And this is what I will try to explain next. So, uh, what can we take from this? That the production of a behavior that is adaptive um, to draw attention uh, without any intention, and also that if tracking the attention of others is beneficial, a sensitivity to the attention of others would gradually, we could expect it to gradually develop. And now the next step is understanding um, uh, the role that indexical objects play in the representation of past actions. But we do recognize that this um, would need, um, this would only happen if uh, representation of past actions improves the evaluation of potential partners and if it is, for example, communicatively helpful. So, uh, more specifically, if it is beneficial to, to the displayer. So, there are two mutually exhaustive classes of natural science. There are natural science and non-natural science. Non-natural science um, are, for example, the paintings inside of caves. But, um, but I'm going to, but in a world uh, without any symbols, only natural science, if anything, can um, denote something else, um, can refer to past actions. Um, and these are two ex examples of natural science. So here's an example of non-intentional natural science, and this is an example of intentional natural science. So how could the inference um, occur? So the inference could, uh, could um, happen through the witnessing of the killing of that infant from another group. So um, there's actually a causal connection between the killing and the display. So um, the idea here is that an individual could see the male uh, chimpanzee killing the infant from another group. And in this case, there would actually be a causal connection between the killing and the display. So the killing here is um, like um, an evidence of that, that, that the killing. But uh, another possibility is that the, the conceptual structure of the, uh, the, the trophy presentation is what we call the displaying of the dead infant is similar to that which underpins the syntax of structures. And this is where it gets very interesting. So first we depart from a, a, a scenario like this, where the displayer um, is carrying around, so the action is display, the display behavior, uh, the trophy, the object, so the, the, the dead infant. And in this case, uh, the ape is the agent, the um, verb is implied, which is killed, and the dead infant is then the patient in the argument structure. And then we have this tiny little step, which is just adding a mimetic gesture to, to, 
uh, to this um, dynamic here. And then we already go, we already arrive to um, this, this configuration, which is where you have a speaker, a mimetic gesture, a mimetic verb, which could be something like, I don't know, like this, which means more specifically killed. And then the trophy again still is the patient and in the example, the dead infant. So the present objects are here uh, symbols of the argument structure and all of them um, try to to point out this uh, sentence which would be I killed infant and why would the adding of a mimetic, mimetic gesture to the pr uh, trophy presentation even be necessary or interesting at all um, well, there are two explanations that we could give. The first one is that it makes imagination more vivid. So how did it, how did this infant um, come to be in your, in your shoulder? Well, I killed him. And the second explanation could be that it reacts directly to the doubts of the audience. So it's already almost like an anticipation of doubts of the audience you um, explain the carrying of your your uh, your trophy as um, they doubt that you did it and you say no no I actually killed this infant so this situation I just explained ex um, shows that in early stages of language development there actually uh, does not have to be um, there. There, there isn't a need of a specific level of trust instated for language to emerge. And from then, on, from there on, there are also specific contexts that do not need universal platform, uh, a universal platform of trust for ang for language to develop. So the, in the first case here is evidence that is difficult to forge. Of course, if you have a dead infant from another group, it's difficult to forge something like that. So if you have the evidence in front of you, uh, you wouldn't need trust. You can just see the evidence. Um, uh, the other context would be in mother-child communication that can be explained by kin selection. And in that context, uh, a specific level of trust is already entailed. So there wouldn't be a need for a universal platform of trust. There's also Darwin's musical proto-language hypothesis, which basically states that it is difficult to forge something like beauty or wit. So in case uh, the hearing of... of um, uh, um, when someone produces a beautiful sound, it is difficult to forge that. So you can simply trust that that person actually does the sound without needing a platform of trust because they cannot forge it. And also bonding via gossip, um, which basically states that, uh, well, people are trying to communicate with each other. And of course, they could lie. But when the idea is simply the communication because of the communication, um, there would need a universal platform of trust. And now we're approaching the end and one could um, ask something like, well, what about culture? What, uh, where does culture come into this? And to that, uh, I just briefly want to say that the source of innovation is actually the same. And that happens through a behavioral shift. So when we're thinking about an individual and the individual has, uh, for example, <clears throat> a different uh, characteristic or displays a specific behavior, um, that will lead to a change in behavior, which they will have to kind of um, uh, work out by themselves. And then if that became, becomes uh, adaptive, that will then uh, pass on to their offspring and eventually um, lead to a change in behavior. And in culture, the, the mechanism is practically the same. So you have 
culture and then there's one change in behavior that if adaptive will then lead to a change in behavior of the uh, in the inside of the culture and now we got to the summary and the new formulation of the problem um so again the evolutionary function of language is a propositional communication or displacement and referring to referring unintentionally to one's own past actions via an indexical object could have happened to our ancestors and but the but the why of why referring to displaced actions is adaptive is still under discussion so we have to there's still the open question of why would such a structure emerge and in what context and now there are a few possible disagreement points that you might have with the suggestion that I just gave in this presentation. The first one is denying that language evolved in a natural process. The second one is to reject uh, that language evolved for communicating propositions. And the third one is um, rejecting the focus on the question of why the function um, or you could I'm sorry, or why, uh, or you could focus on the question of why the function became adaptive in only one specific uh, species of ape. And now we come to the conclusion. And uh, we can therefore conclude from this presentation uh, this. The function first approach solves both major problems of language evolution. First, it solves the problem of graduality because in an argument-like structure, um, I'm sorry, because uh, an argument-like structure is already present in the display of indexical objects. And it solves the problem of trust because objects are there as um, evidence and there can be, they can take place in developments. Uh, the development can take place in niches of trust and there's also gossip and the trophy display is also consistent with competence before compre the competence before comprehension comprehension paradigm which um, also helps us uh, understand it in a more broader context and now we can then reformulate the problem of language evolution in this new manner so now, after dissolving both uh, traditional problems, there is a need to search for an evolutionary configuration in which displacement and propositional communication became adaptive. This has to be the focus from now on. Thank you so much for uh, listening to this presentation. And yeah, bye bye.